So welcome to the Champlain Mooney House. I think I know most of you, but I'm Janet Petrich and I own the building and open it for community events. So I'd like to welcome you and say, what a great, it's a big crowd. I'm very excited. Um, thanks, Mark, for coming back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, he handed me an introduction. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase some of it. Please. But it's, but it is, it's, yeah, it's very good, and I want people to understand what a great author you are. So our guest today is Mark Berry. He's an award-winning author, originally from right up here. Uh, Mark and his wife, Christine, right back there. Hi, Christine. Hi. <laughs> have been living year-round in Florida for the past six years. His first novel, A Civil War Love Story, garnered national attention as a finalist in the prestigious Eric Hoffer Book Awards. The book was also awarded a gold medal for historical fiction by the Florida Authors and Publishers Association. Mark's latest novel, called The Commodore and the Powder Monkey, is about a young girl disguised as a boy on the Commodore's flagship during the War of 1812. As a result of writing this book, Mark has assembled a presentation entitled Seven Facts About the War of 1812 That Will Amaze You. So please welcome Mark Berry. Thank you. It must have been a really good author. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been at something. <laughs> I, I, I forgive me, Jim, but that was a habit of mine. When I go to, we speak all over. Christine comes with me, and we, I go all over Central Florida. I have seven or eight engagements in the next two months, and uh, and you can't go to a, whether it's a Kiwanis meeting or Daughters of the American Revolution. You have to bring your introduction. They expect it in advance most of the time. So I've written one for every book, and so I just hand them out like candy. <laughs> Coming back to my hometown it does seem a rather egotistical thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, thank you for a great introduction. Yeah. But before I begin my formal remarks, I want to, you know, obviously many of you know Christine, but you probably haven't met my publisher. His name is Noah. He's three years old. He's way back there. And you hear me talking while I'm talking. I can probably him. His dad is Eric. He's my favorite son-in-law. Your only son-in-law. <laughs> so I'm really nervous tonight, so I have to please Eric before it's over. Some of you already know this from previous times when I came here, but Christine happens to be an expert genealogist. She's been doing it since she was 16 years old. She was son with her father. Now she's the official genealogist for the Fruit de la Society of Quebec. I would say that right. Looks like she's got another job for the founders of uh, Quebec province. And uh, she's the reason I started writing uh, books, uh, other than the whole history books. And she's probably playing for that too. But one day she walked in announced that I had relatives that fought in the Civil War. And then she announced that I had a fourth, I get a look, my fourth great-grandfather fought in the War of 1812, and my fifth great-grandfather uh, fought in the Revolutionary War. So I'm going to say before Calvin does, I have an illustrious ancestry, but a somewhat checkered past. Is that, that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, Christine has a clipboard with her, and I, if you haven't already signed up, Please do so. Drop me your email address because I have a drawing about every three months. Somebody somewhere is going to get a hundred dollar gift card to Amazon or a hundred dollar bill. That's the way I can expand my email list. So please sign up. She's also got some mystery pictures. And those can be passed around too. You've got to guess what the mystery. Are you Steve Martin? Holy crap! Right here. Sorry, rush hour traffic. <laughs> 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 Come on, get the <laughs> You must rave. You must be important. <laughs> Anyway, um, take a look at the mystery pictures because there'll be questions. You have to work for your seat tonight. You ask me any questions. Now, uh, I should explain before you write a historical fiction book, you might actually read 35 to 50 history books, non fiction books. And you read dozens and dozens of articles, including PhD dissertations, and master's thesis, because although it's historical fiction, I can make up a lot of what's in the book. You can't screw up any of the historical facts, because there's always some history buff like Eric Ashton, and I'll tell you, you get that right. And so you've got to get it right. And so this presentation tonight is actually a collection of the trivia and all the tidbits and all of the relatively unknown information uh, that I, I picked up as I was writing this book about the, uh, the War of 1812. 
So I begin with a question for you. This should be easy here. Down in Florida, nobody gets this question correct. Winston Churchill described this battle as the most decisive engagement of the war. Teddy Roosevelt said it was the greatest naval battle in the War of 1812. Which battle are they talking about? Battle of Plattsburgh. Battle of Plattsburgh. Nobody knows that in Florida, so I always tell you. I think I'm smart. There's actually two battles in the Battle of Plattsburgh, one on land, one on water. This book is about the one on water. And uh, I don't have to tell you that Plattsburgh is 25 miles north of the border, so I'll skip that. South of the border. Anyway, the land battle uh, stopped when the, uh, the lake battle ended in the uh, defeat of the British on Lake Champlain. And just to give you some background, the British captain that was in charge of the British fleet at the time was a guy named George Downing. And he was up against a fellow whose name you recognize, Commodore Thomas McDonough. Now, McDonough was at a decided disadvantage. You may not know that. Uh, British artillery could outshoot anything that the Americans had. They could uh, outdistance all that American artillery. They had more artillery, they had bigger artillery, they had greater crew. They had about 36 guns and 300 crew members. We only had, on the American side, about 26 guns and about 240 crew members. But the gods of war were not with the British uh, that weekend, back on September 11th, 1814. Uh, McDonough positioned his flagship the Saratoga, just inside the Cumberland Bay, if you've ever been there. I actually tucked it way <coughs> inside, very close to shore, but not close enough for the British land cannon to hit it, but far enough so that if he thought, anyway, if Danny wanted to reach him, he'd have to come into the Cumberland Bay. And he was hoping to lure the captain in. Uh, what happened then was that Downey learned the hard way that Cumberland Bay is a very tricky place to be. First of all, the north to south wind that brought his ships from Canada and the Plattsburgh were no longer helping him because to get into the bay and get all the way to the end of the bay, he had to go south to north. So the winds were against him. And as some of the locals in Plattsburgh will tell you, the Cumberland Bay is kind of a mysterious bay. It has all these strange currents and eddies and shifting winds and breezes. It's a very tricky place if you have a sailboat. Captain Downey didn't know that. Uh, and so it took him a long time, once he made the corner of the Cumberland Head, to get all the way into the bay. Uh, and that's when he made his first big mistake. This is going to amaze you, I think. He could have anchored his boats right on the corner. His cannon could have reached the American fleet. All, all he had to do was sit on the corner, drop his anchor, sit on the corner, and shoot at the American fleet, which is stuck inside the bay. His cannons were that powerful. And the American fleet was sitting there inside the bay at anchor. They weren't even moving. So he had five or six non-moving targets. That's all he had to do. But he didn't do it. Instead, he went into the bay. Uh, when he, by the time he got his flagship into the bay, it was called the Confiance big ship. A lot of guns, very powerful, just recently built. The shoals, the narrowness of the bay, the shifting winds, the mysterious currents and eddies, Took him a long time to get into position. Well, before he even got into position, McDonough got off from actually the second shot of the battle, the first one being going to be his lieutenants to fight it. But McDonough got off the first shot of the battle, and right down the middle of the confiance, took out a couple of dozen men, killed several dozen more wounded. Okay? Uh, and the fight was on. And uh, in 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes later, Captain George Downey was dead. That's how long he survived in that. A one-ton uh, barrel from, on his ship was hit by one of the American cannons, flew off its carriage and hit him right in the chest. Killed him instantly. Didn't have a mark on him. His pocket watch was stopped at the exact time that he was killed. And nobody on the other British ships knew that their captain had been killed. And so they were leaderless for the next hour and a half, which is how much longer the battle lasted. Uh, down his ship, had already lost most of its guns about an hour later. So did the American ships. The Confiance was down to one gun. The Saratoga was down to no guns. And that's when Commodore McDonough proved to the military and to the world that he was the smartest captain ever. Previous to the battle, he had designed and decided to implement what they called uh, catch anchors and springs. What springs were, where there's a series of small anchors, the regular anchors on the boat, and ropes. 
And a spring, if this was a boat, a spring, the springs on the boat would allow you literally to, they called it, win the ship. So the ship was like this. Well, with all the men pulling on certain ropes and cutting certain anchors, the ship would literally turn like this. Now, some of you can figure, if this side he had nine guns that were no longer working, on the other side he had nine guns that did work. The confidants tried to do the same thing. It screwed it up miserably. <laughs> so even before the ship was completely around, the American cannons started firing at Downey's ship. Downey was long gone. And within five minutes, the Confiance struck its colors, surrendered. The other British ships saw the same thing. They surrendered too. Okay? And that's how the British lost the, the Plattsburgh. By the way, on the land, uh, General Prevost was on the land with troops outnumbering the American troops three to one. When he saw that the Americans had defeated the British on the lake, he turned tail and run too. He could have stayed, by the way. He could have defeated the American troops easily, <coughs> hands down. But for some reason, he said, no, it's got to be a coordinated attack, so he just turned tail and ran back to Canada. And so that's what happened in, in the battle. Now, magically, that ship turns around, they fire its guns, they defeat the, uh, they defeat the combines, uh, and everybody surrenders, so McDonough becomes the hero of the day. But now, historians are still arguing, why did Downey do that? I interviewed several authors on the Battle of Plattsburgh and asked the same question. They all said the same thing. That's the $64 million question. Why didn't George Downey, Captain George Downey, just stay at the corner, right on the, the corner of the bay, fire his long-range artillery, and take out the American fleet? Some historians have said, well, it's because he wasn't used to doing that. His battles, he didn't have that many of them, were always on the high seas, and they were never under anchor. They were always moving around, okay? Some other historians say, no, he was a cocky SOV, and he thought he knew everything, and he was going against an inferior uh, armada, and so that's why he didn't do it. But uh, his opinion of Captain McDonough, or Commodore McDonough, and the uh, Lake Champlain Navy was wrong, in his case, dead wrong. So. Now, here's the, here's the thing that, that uh, makes the battle so important. You might not know this. About a month earlier, not even a month before the Battle of Plattsburgh, negotiations between the British and the Americans had already gone, begun in debt back in Belgium. And the British at that time felt that they had the upper hand. And so they weren't demanding much. They demanded one third of the continental U.S. be turned back to Britain. And the American negotiators, oh my God, this is crazy, but they thought they would have to give them back, give the English back one third of the continental United States. Uh, they had just begun the negotiations. They had just burned down the White House. They had burned down a good part of the Capitol building, so the British were really feeling their oats, so to speak. Uh, and then the word comes back to England that guess what? The Americans won at the Battle of Plattsburgh. Uh, when they got word of the Battle of Plattsburgh, everything changed dramatically. The British people were very tired of their 20-year war with France already. There are, some of you would be familiar with this phenomenon, there were tax right up to the years to pay for the war. Okay? Uh, and the British people were sick of us. They said, no, no. We thought this would be a quick and easy uh, American war, a war against the Americans, just like the Russia thought it would be quick and easy in Ukraine. We got the surprise of their life. They said, we're not going to do this for another 20 years. So they screamed at their parliament members. Parliament screamed at the negotiators. They told the negotiators, cut a deal, cut a deal right now. And they did. And so the treaty was signed. And other than the exchange of prisoners, there were really no significant uh, concessions by either the British or the Americans. So here's the question that I asked my friends in Florida. Why didn't any of you know about the Battle of Plattsburgh? We're all local, so we knew about the Battle of Plattsburgh. Down there, they never heard of it. Uh, why did it disappear, literally disappear, in the annals of American history? Well, there's a couple of answers. On the same day of the Battle of Plattsburgh, there was another battle going on, the Battle of Fort McHenry. And it wasn't a significant battle militarily. In fact, it was a stalemate. The British didn't really defeat the Americans. The Americans didn't really defeat the British. But during that battle, there was a guy on shore watching the battle. His name was Francis Scott Key. And he wrote a little poem. And he called it, very unromantically, uh, let me see if I got it here, he called it The Defense of Fort Montgomery. For, excuse me, Fort Montgomery. Fort Montgomery, excuse me. Uh, and, 
And everybody since then has been talking about that battle, and of course about Francis Scott Key. So here's the rest of the story. When he wrote that book, historians now believe that he had a certain tune in mind, and sure enough, it was set to music just three or four weeks later, after the Battle of Fort McHenry. And uh, it was set to the tune of a song called, i got to say this right, Anacreon in the Heaven. Anybody ever heard of that? Strange. Anacreon in the Heaven. It was the theme song used by, not coincidentally, the Anacreontic Society in London. Do you know what that was? That was a group of amateur English musicians and when they went to the pub, that was their drinking song. <laughs> <laughs> True story. True story. But that was one of the reasons that the Battle of Plattsburgh got buried in the annals of American military history, because everybody was talking about the Star Spangled Banner. By the way, when they released it with music, that's when they changed the name to the Star Spangled Banner. By the way, I should have mentioned earlier that McDonough was desperate to man his boats, or staff his boats, gotta be careful these days. The staff was boats. He could not get enough people. I mean, literally, days before the battle, he still didn't have enough people to man all his boats. Anyway, he recruited, believe it or not, I found the evidence that he was recruiting in Albany. Uh, he went to Vermont and recruited people there. He regularly begged the army to loan him some of his, some of his soldiers to staff his ships. They were still short, so one of his first lieutenants, a guy named Joseph Smith, who worked on the Eagle, uh, he said he wasn't going to disappoint the Commodore. So he went back to the Army, the General and uh, General Patrick, I forgot his name already. Uh, anyway, McComb, General McComb, how can I forget that name? And he begged McComb for some more members of the Army. McComb said, No, I've given you enough. No way, you're not getting any more. We need every man we get. We're out number three to one when Provost shows up. It is a British Army. So Smith says, Are there any other Army people hanging around? He said, well, there's about 40 of them in the local prison. They're all in there for various criminals. I'll take them. <laughs> and he literally went to the prison and uh, pulled out 40 different prisoners, all convicted of criminal records, cleaned them up, gave them a shave, gave them a bath, gave them uniforms, and all put them on his boat, the Eagle. And, and they all served honorably. So a lot of them died, by the way. But that's how desperate they were for, uh, for manpower uh, way back then. Now, I'm going to go about my, one of my mystery pictures. Mystery picture number one. Who's got it? Yeah. I got it. Can you figure out what it is? No. Take a gash. Anybody? Which one is it? That's the one with the... Baseball bats. Tongs. <laughs> Big tongs, yeah. <laughs> barbecue tool, maybe? I doubt it. <laughs> no? No barbecue tool? Calvin, can you guess? You didn't see it, Bob. It's a big Square. set of square glass. I'll give you all a big hint. Hot shot. That's oh, yeah. me, but there's something else. Yeah. <laughs> you know what hot shot is in this story? Well, the British yeah, had this heat the cannonball. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What they would do is they would heat the, they had little portable furnaces on their ships, and they would heat the cannonball to red hot. Now these cannonballs were pretty powerful. Uh, they could do a lot of damage, but in addition to the damage, wood splinters everywhere. It probably set the uh, set the ship on fire. It was also used. Hot shot was also used by the Americans to burn the British out of houses in Plattsburgh. There was about 13 houses in Plattsburgh that were being occupied by the British, and the Americans didn't like that, so they shot hot shot at the houses, burned the houses down, and that's how way they evicted the British from the homes. Uh, it was first used. Hot shot was first used back. Uh, Calvin might remember this back in 1579 <laughs> in the battle between Poland and Russia. And then it was also used in Yorktown, but it wasn't us that used it in Yorktown, it was the French back in 1781. Uh, they used it against the HMS Sharon with very, very uh, good results. And that's when the Americans first saw hot shot. Mm, very good idea. So that's when they adopted it. Just to give you some perspective, a 24 pound cannonball could be shot almost two miles from its target. And when it hit its target, it would slice through almost two feet of solid wood. That's how powerful those things were. Now, can you imagine one of those flying at you? And it's red hot at the time it lands. They did a lot of damage. In fact, there was a one fire in the middle of the battle class where we done his ship, his flagship, and everybody in the crew had to stop uh, and put out that fire. In fact, there's a scene in the book about the uh, powder monkey. Anybody know what a powder monkey is, by the way? That's that's the young sure you know what it is. That's the young short person who would run into the hole, bring up a canister of gunpowder, and give it to the cannon crews on the, on the upper deck, top deck. 
She didn't help put out the, the fires, obviously. She's only gunpowder. But anyway, that's in the book, and you read about it there. Uh, now, if you remember the ship, the USS Constitution had a nickname called Old Ironsides. That was a specially built ship that actually withstood cannonballs. And when the cannonball hit the ship because of the special ribbing, the special wood they used, it literally bounced off the side of the ship. And there was a sailor on board who said, look at that. <coughs> the cannonballs are just bouncing off old Ironsides, he called it. And that's how the ship got its nickname from one of the, one of the crew. Uh, so that's what those tongs are. They had to take those balls out of the furnace. They didn't do it with their bare hands. They took them out with the tongs, bought them over the cannon, put them in there, and off they got fired. Now there's another mystery picture out there, mystery picture yeah. number two. That's an easy one, Mark. You should know that one. Well, it looks like a harpoon, but I... Yes, it does, but it wasn't a harpoon. I say, that's what it says. It, had a, it was a harpoon. <laughs> it was a harpoon with uh, an explosive charge at the end. Now, see how good you are at history here. Who invented the steamboat? Oh, oh. He invented that. And that wasn't a harpoon. It was his version of a torpedo. Okay. And uh, I should explain that a little bit. Uh, he got the name torpedo when he invented this from a fish. You and I would call that fish, well, they, they called it the electro forest. You and I would call that the electric stingray. But anyway, the a nickname for that fish was the Torpedo Electricus. So he decided to nickname his new weapon the Torpedo Electricus. And he was peddling this new weapon in Europe. He tested it in Europe very successfully. He blew up a ship with it. Okay? And at least for a little while, the English were very impressed with it. And then the First Lord of the Admiralty and some of his top admirals figured out, wait a minute, if this torpedo works very well, they're not going to need the Navy anymore. So they kicked Fulton out of England and go back to the States. So he didn't, he didn't want to give up. He had a good friend in the United States. You might remember him. His name was Thomas Jefferson. And he taught the president of $5,000. And they would conduct a test of his torpedo uh, in the United States. And uh, this torpedo, by the way, is very similar to a, a floating device. And the way it would work is they would have a little, sh a little boat with seven or eight men in it and the harpoon. And they try to get as close as they could to the enemy ship, fire the harpoon, and when that arrow hit the ship, big, big explosion. Well, Fulton wanted a full dress rehearsal with real explosives. And they said, no, 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 fake, do no explosive. So then he said, well, God, I want to go after a big ship, not just a tiny ship. So he tried to talk him into the USS President, which if you remember, was a good-sized American ship. No, no, I'm not going to do that. They gave him a little ship called the Argus, and they said, if you can harpoon that one successfully, then we'll buy lots of harpoons and we'll start using this torpedo, so to speak. Now, the Argus was giving fair warning that they would be under torpedo attack. So the Argus didn't fool around. They had special boards off the side of their ship. They had special nets. They had long hooks. So if a small boat showed up, they could push it away or pull it in, whatever it is. So, so make a long story longer. Fulton's little rowboat with seven or eight guys and a harpoon never even got close to the Argus. So the, the test was a massive failure. failure. They did it back in May of 1810. And so Jefferson fired Fulton, and they didn't come up with a good torpedo until much later, actually, the Civil War. So, so much for the to today's uh, torpedo. Now, this you might know about. <coughs> Before the 18, War of 1812, there was a tremendous amount of smuggling going on between the U.S. and Canada, both on the New York side and the Vermont side of the lake. A lot of smuggling. And uh, when, when the war started, just before the war started, Madison and Monroe got together and they passed the embargo access. No more cross-border trade. Enough of that. Because we don't want to get pulled into this British war with the French, the French war with the British. And if they think we're aiding and abetting their enemy, we're going to get sucked into this war. And everybody in the country agreed, except the people that lived in upstate New York, where we lived, and upstate Vermont. They said, wait a minute, we've been doing that for decades, a generation, two generations. And that's how we make our living. We would sell um, all sorts of stuff to Canada, in, including... Um, potash. Potash, thank you very much, on my brain system. Potash, all sorts of raw materials to Canada, and they in turn would supply finished goods 
here in the United States. We'd sell them the wool, they'd come back with woolen goods. And uh, so the North Country people, both in Vermont and New York, said, we're not doing that embargo thing. And they protested it, and they did whatever they wanted to. Okay, and they kept doing that. And uh, in reading, and they weren't necessarily unpatriotic. Later on, they got more patriotic, and I'll tell you why. But in the, in the beginning, they got very good at smoking. And that's what I want to tell you about, some of the true stories about what they did with how they smuggled their goods. Uh, one of them, for, for example, they load a raft up with contraband, smuggled goods. And then they would get right to the line, jump off the raft, and of course some of you already know, the Lake Fuller's Falls flows south to north, and it would get in the channel, and that raft would float with no person on it, right across the border. There was nobody to arrest. Okay? And there was somebody on the side to grab the raft and take the smuggled goods. Another one I liked is they would build a dock right next to the line, have the raft tied to the dock, and then when nobody was looking, they just slip the rope off the raft and just take off. And that's how they smuggled uh, they would, This is a true story. One guy built a shed on a hill just south of the international boundary line. And his foundation wasn't too good. Actually, his foundation was precisely measured and figured out. And all he had to do was pull a rope attached to one log and the entire shed would go boop like that. And all the barrels of potash would roll out of the building, down the hill, into Canada. And some guy on the other side picked up 50 or 60 barrels of potash. <laughs> 100 bucks a barrel, it's a lot of money. You could make him one smuggling run, but this might remind you of the bootlegging days. You could make him one smuggling run back then, if you will. Uh, the same amount of money you would make if you worked for two years straight. That's how valuable smuggling was. Uh, one of my favorites, and it's in the book, was a wagon, horse-drawn wagon, covered with a tarp. And under the tarp, tons and tons of contraband, and two little kids in their preteen years who had been given more than their share of cider, <laughs> fermented cider. And by the time they got to the line, they were sicker than a dog, throwing up and wheezing and groaning and complaining. And so when the guy with the horse got to the border, the customs guy said, what do you got? He said, two sick kids, and you could hear them back there throwing up. What's the matter with them? Ah, I said, I think they got the yellow fever. We're going up to there. Like, Get him out of here now! And he'd kick him out. And he got across the line with a wagon full of contraband and two sick kids who eventually fell asleep. True story. That actually happened. And there's a version of it in the book. You might like it. So, uh, they also had another trick where they had what they call fake pirates. So if Steve was on the lake with his ship by previous arrangement, I would come along as a pirate and I would steal his raft or his whatever his contraband was on the ship, whatever it is. And he would say, oh me, oh my, I got robbed by pirates. And then the pirates go across and sell everything, and then come back to the States and give Steve a share and keep the other ship. And it's that way you never got caught, you never got thrown in jail. Because toward, toward the end, you could get shot for what they considered to be treasonous, treasonous activity. Uh, in the end, you might remember, they burned down the White House, they mentioned that, but also they went into Vermont, and the first thing the British troops did when they came into Vermont, just prior to the fight of Pottsburg, is they seized everybody's guns. You don't do that in the state of Vermont. And so all the Vermonters got very, very angry. And the upstate New Yorkers got angry. They found out that the executive mansion, which is what they called it back then, got burned down. And suddenly all those smugglers got very, very patriotic. And they picked up their weapons, and a whole bunch of volunteers from Vermont came to the Battle of Pattsburgh. A whole bunch of Americans volunteered for the land battle of Pattsburgh. So in the end, they all they knew what the true colors were. But historians have said, but for the smuggling, the British Army wouldn't have been able to feed their troops, and they wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to build their ships. That's how much smuggling was going on. Everything from wooden spars, lumber, potash, you name it, that's what they smuggled. So, one last item. Uh, my latest book, though, the one I didn't bring enough copies of because they didn't arrive, uh, The Commodore and the Powder Monkey, is about a young girl who disguises herself as a boy, and she ends up on the Commodore's flagship as a powder monkey in the Battle of Plattsburgh. Kind of fun to write. Uh, and I've had a few, few people tell me, well, that's kind of an outlandish supposition. No, it wasn't. There were two women on the Commodore's flagship. 
serving on the ship. One of them was the cook's wife, her name was Phoebe, and the other one was uh, just a plain old seaman. And, uh, and McDonough didn't even get a choice. They just told him, you want us? You got a wife too. And McDonough, being a wise man and a married man, said, yes, man, you know, didn't object. So they had him on the ship. Uh, about a year before the Battle of Pottsburg, he had sent, uh, what's his name, uh, Smith to the border. Uh, and, uh, I think his name was Smith. Yeah. Told him not to go north of Hawaii. He said, just keep the British and the Canadian side of the border. And don't go into Canada. Well, this guy didn't pay any attention. And so he decided he was going to go in hot pursuit of these uh, two English boats, gunboats. Well, he got down into the, really, the Sorel River, the Reshu River, and he got next to Ash Island. It was very narrow. He couldn't turn around. By that time, if he wanted to go back, he was fighting that south-north current. And the river was narrow enough, and there's British artillery firing on this side and British artillery firing on that side. Well, believe it or not, the Eagle and the Growler both sunk American ships. The British fished them out of the river, refitted them, reworked them, and they became British ships after that. That's my long story. I'll try to make it a little bit less longer. Anyway, they captured everybody on both ships. A couple got killed, but they captured most everybody. They put them in prison. They're in prison for about two weeks, and they discover that one of the prisoners is not a guy. <laughs> <laughs> they released her. They, they released her immediately. They said, no, we're not keeping her in jail with all these other guys. So the idea that a, a young girl uh, or even a woman could serve on one of the American ships during the Battle of Plattsburgh is not, uh, not too far-fetched. Uh, happened uh, quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Uh, there's one that you've heard of, uh, just one more quick story here. You've heard of Laura Secord Chocolates? Have you heard of those chocolates? Mm -hmm. Maybe I've heard of those chocolates. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, there's a story about her, and uh, she was famous because she was very active in the war, and she's referred to by historians <coughs> as the female Paul Revere. Because what she did is she warned the British that the Americans were coming. Mm -hmm. Just the opposite. And her name was Laura Secord. She was home nursing her wounded husband. And back then, when the uh, Americans took control of a village or a town, whatever it was, just like the British did, they forced the locals to give them room and board. So Laura Secord, this very loyal British Canadian, uh, had two officers, British officers, in her house at the time while she was nursing her husband. And so did I see British? I meant to say American. Yeah, she had two American officers in there. And uh, those two American officers talked too much. And Laura Secord was very good at listening a lot. <laughs> and she overheard them talking about an attack, how the Americans were going to attack the British outpost called Beaver, Beaver Dams. It's a small village near present-day Brock University in Ontario. So she said, I'm not going to put up with this. So she decided to walk to Beaver Dam, 18 miles away, through the woods, thick brush, so on and so forth. And she manages to get there. She warns the British that the Americans are coming. The British take measures. They surprise the Americans. They ambush the Americans. And the Americans lost that battle miserably. And for the longest time, they didn't know why. But it was because they had two big mouth soldiers in the same house as Laura Secord. And to this day, she's considered the uh, Canadian hero. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, that's another speech Sunday I have to give it here. It's uh, the role that women have played in wars, in American wars. Uh, it's amazing how many women were very, very significant in these wars. And I think these days is probably a topic. Anyway, that concludes my formal remarks. I've got some books here. I would love to have any questions uh, that you might have for me. Just don't ask me anything I can't answer. Uh, Christine is in charge of all the cash and the books. And I do apologize in advance. I've got, um, I ordered a bunch of books from my printer, the Commodore books, and I've only got one left. But if you want one, I will ship one to you, postage free, and it'll be there probably at your house within a week. Uh, just sign up. She's got a list to sign up if you want one of those. And you can buy any of the local history books. There's one here on the border. Uh, I've got to tell you, frankly, though, I'm not here to sell books and they look like it. But you don't make money selling books. You, if you want to get rich, you need to be an auctioneer uh, or work for the government, whatever it happens to be right there. But my publisher, four years ago, five years ago, he said, look, he said, if you want to become known as an author, you've got to get off your butt and get out the door. 
He said, first of all, I'll write a trilogy, which I've just finished. But he said, go go on, talk to people. So I go all over Central Florida. I go, I've been in Vermont, I've been in New York, obviously. And so I'm here today just so that you spread the word that you know this guy who's an author, he's not half bad, and he might be full of hot air, but he was fun to listen to. <laughs> Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Very much. Who's got, who's got a question for me? Remember when they found the anchor from the British flagship? Yes. And, and the story then at the time was that it came loose because the shot from the American came, which was probably true, but they said that that's when the British ship went astray, and that was changed the whole battle because the British couldn't couldn't fire on to the Americans. I mean, that it made it out like that anchor being knocked loose turned the whole battle around, but yeah. was that embellished a little bit? And, and embellished to the point of being fiction. Yeah. But do you remember that story? Yes, I do. Yes. I do. I, now, and I didn't know it at the time, but I do know it now. You have to understand that they could fire a cannon and load it up with powder and get the cannonball in it, and you could do it once every minute. Now multiply that times eight, because they had eight cannons on the Saratoga, and multiply that times six ships, each of their own cannon, and add to that gunboats. You had about ten gunboats that also had a small cannon. And now you're looking at all the rigging on the ship, the ropes that hold the anchor, the ropes that hold the sails, the ropes that hold all the when the, the battle plans were finished, this, the Saratoga alone, there wasn't a sail left standing. There wasn't even a line big enough to hold a handkerchief. Those cannons ripped everything in sight. And so if there was a rope or a string of it would got cut off by a cannon. So I think the cannon was loosened that way. And I also no. believe that the strategic error in the battle was Captain Downey's. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 the strategic genius was McDonough when he decided to put springs on a ship so he could literally turn around and free up eight unused cannons when virtually everybody else in the battle had no cannons left because they'd all been destroyed. One more thing and then I... Sure. But the, the, no, the, the, there, was, the, there was a hospital on Crab Island? Yes. So, yeah. And, and, and those hospital patients got a cannon somehow from I think a boat that went aground and actually used it to fire onto the other onto the British ships. Now I read that on the plaque at Cumberland Bay <laughs> State Camp. Right? Actually, before so the actually, hospital was even activated, they were given two cannons by the Americans. Okay. And they hit them in the brush. And the orderlies were told when you're not handling a patient, we expect you to be firing those there cannons. Yeah. There was a British ship that drifted its way because they lost their acre to Crab Island and the orderlies did fire on it, and yeah. those, that British flag went down pretty quick. But yeah, there were actually two buildings on Crab Island, uh, and after the battle was over, they retrieved both English and British soldiers. The very last thing in the book is set on Crab Island, and I won't give you the details, but somebody's buried alive on Crab Island. And, uh, but uh, Crab Island was an awful Are place to be there? after the battle. <laughs> 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 no, 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 that line was an awful place to be because people were horribly wounded. I mean, legs are missing, arms are missing. Uh, there's a scene in the book, true story by the way, of a guy that got hit by a cannon. Uh, not by a cannon, but by a shard of wood. And he's desperately trying to pick up his entrails on the deck of the boat. And he's trying to stuff him in. And his American compadres pick him up and throw him overboard. True story. It's in a diary. Uh, cannon war on the lake and water was ugly. And Crab Island had all these horribly wounded people, but worse than that, when the waves hit the Crab Island, you looked at the waves, there were bodies, there were parts of bodies, mm -hmm. there were entrails. You know, people have a tendency to romanticize the war and glorify it. And um, I was actually criticized, I was at the Daughters of American Revolution once, she said, why is your book, this one here, said, why is it so violent? And I hadn't thought about it, and I said, you know, the honest answer is, it was a violent time. And I didn't read 50 books about the Revolutionary War without coming away with this sense, awful sense of violence. And the War of 1812 was very violent too. And uh, people died of uh, disease, but they died, and they died of their wounds. And a lot of people died very, very young. So that's why there's some violent scenes in the book. So I apologize in advance if some of you turned off by the violence. But it is historically accurate. Who's got an easier question than Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? What's next? What's next? What's next on your I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one chapter into a book about the Spanish-American War. Do you, you remember the sinking of the Maine? Were you there at the time? No. 1898? <laughs> you sure? Okay. Uh, oh, my brother was. 
They, <laughs> well, actually, there was a Plattsburgh connection. I'm probably going to put him in the book. There was a guy named Hart, but he went on the ship as Horn. I don't know why he changed his name, but he got killed in the, uh, when the main was exploded. exploded. The battleship main was sitting in Havana, Harbor, in Cuba. The war of 1812 was declared mostly because somebody sunk that ship. But, you know, I'm 50 books, probably 48 books, into this thing with the Spanish American War. And to this day, historians are still arguing about who sunk the main. There's one pe bunch of people that say the Spanish did it because they were mad at the Americans for sticking their nose where it didn't belong and they used an underground, underwater mine or a torpedo. There's another group that says, no, the rebels, the Cuban rebels did it because they wanted the Americans to come in on their side of the war. There's another group that said there were some mercenaries and they made a mistake. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So that's a, a historical fiction writer's dream. Nobody really knows who or even what sunk the USS Maine. So to answer your question, that's what's next. It's going to be, it's not going to be love and war, but there is a love interest in it. It's going to be who done it. And you have to figure out before you get to the end of the book who I think about it. And, uh, it's a very hard book to write because it's called. Uh, Christine gave me the, the hint, I had to look it up. It's called Reverse Chronology. Have any of you ever read a, maybe a detective story where the murder occurs in the first half and then the rest of the book is who done it? That's what this is going to be. The explosion occurs in the first chapter and then the rest of the book is who done it. So, and uh, I found out, as Christine knows the hard way, that when you retire and go to Florida, man does not live by golf alone. And that's what I do. I write books, I research books, I market books, and I'm having a blast. I'm not making any money, but if I get in trouble, I'll just go to Steve and borrow a couple of money. Sometimes they get one of your books, so I'm about to write. Is this a new style of writing factual fiction? It's called historical fiction. Okay. And uh, no, historical fiction has been a genre that's been around for decades and decades, and people much more famous and much more successful than I've ever been there. I like it because, as I mentioned years ago, Christine infected me with her love of history. Back then it was local history. And we ended up, as Steve knows, because he helped us get rid of a lot, we had the biggest collection of local history books and paraphernalia and memorabilia in the North Country. And then we went to Florida. I'm not ready anymore because nobody has a history like the North Country. And then damn it, she didn't come into the living room one day and tell me about my ancestors and all these wars. <laughs> and now I'm trying to buy all the books back that I gave to you to sell. <laughs> Probably for twice the price you got for me. Hopefully. <laughs> anyway, what else can I tell you? I kept you here too long as it is. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you so much. Oh, I Thanks. enjoyed it. I, I was telling Janet earlier, I'm going to be back in May. I'm coming up here actually not to see you folks with my grandkids. And little Noah's back there. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm coming back up in May because Eric and my daughter Alex, uh, I think they need some extra help. And Matt's out of town, Matt Burr's out of town for a week, whatever. And they need some <laughs> extra sitting help. And anyway, I happen, uh, well, many of you know Mary O'Connor, Pat's wife. And she was very upset she wanted to be tonight. And she said she couldn't make it. And she apologized because the Catholic daughters rearrange their meeting from next week until this week. And I said, don't worry, Mary, I'll be back and I'll bring you a signed book. I'm coming back in May. And she writes back, she says, what date? She said, I talked to Ann Paulson to the Point Library. We're setting, getting out at Halstead Hall, and you can speak there. <laughs> so, I'll be back with more books if you're running out there. So, anyway. uh, there's some cookies out there. Yeah, cookies. And we bought some water. Some drinks. Yeah, you bought the wine. I brought the wine. <laughs> Apparently you thought my, my audience should 